This Minnesota team, when he acquired uh, Rudy Gobert with Carl Anthony Towns and Nas Reed, there was a lot of skepticism, right? Can this work? But what they've done a really great job of defensively, they've got great athletes on the perimeter. Anthony Edwards, Jaden McDaniels, they run plays off the three-point line, and they chase from behind. And as you get into the basket, now you got to deal with Gobert, Carl Anthony Towns, and Nas Reed. So it's really, you know, they're really starting to really figure out their game offensively, defensively. And what really dominated tonight's game was the third quarter. The separation in the third quarter, the Warriors could never really threaten after that. They made a nice furious run at the end there with the substitutions. Uh, but the third quarter is where Minnesota really took control of this game. A lot of jump passes I saw in the third quarter got where the Warriors would drive into the paint and just be up in the air trying to make a pass to people that were not there. Turnovers led to the, the, the Minnesota Timberwolves running the other way. A lot of those passes in transition, you see those clips right there, getting to the paint. Anthony Edwards breaking the defense down, getting to the paint for shots, for layups, getting fouled at the, if, and going to the free throw line, getting buckets that way. I think the Warriors got to do a better job on the defensive end. I, I will focus on defense because I think you have to generate some defense and get points that way from turnovers, first turnovers, and then get points that way to be able to go out on the offensive end. But Minnesota just seemed to get more open looks on the offensive end than the Golden State Warriors tonight. I think the points in the paint, I'll keep harping on that because I think that's two games in a row now when they played against a team with bigs that really forced the Warriors out of their comfort zone and, and focused on the threes. And it's really clear the opposing defenses are trying to run the Warriors off the three mm -hmm. and then contest twos. And we talk pregame again is when you run off the uh, three-point line, that next shot doesn't have to be the closest shot. You know, when you're going into Gobert and, and Call of Duty Towns, a contested layup is not a great shot. If you can pull up from 12 to 14 feet and get an open look, that's the shot I would prefer players take. Uh, in this day, this day uh, of analytics, it's take away the three and take away the layup. So naturally what's open is that mid-range. I know analytics does not like that shot, but for, my, for me, an uh, open shot is better than a contested shot, whether it be a three or a layup. Well, the Timberwolves did a nice job of taking away that three-point range from the Warriors tonight. The Warriors shooting just 27.9% from three-point range. However, Steph Curry with another big game, 38 points for Steph. Even the game against Denver, KCP, he did a great job chasing Steph Curry around. Steph's putting up dynamic numbers, MVP numbers. He needs to uh, his teammates to find their rhythm and their flow. Uh, and it, to me, it's not just the starters or the subs. I think Steve Kerr has to look at sprinkling in a few different lines. They're not necessarily changing the starting lineup, but, but within the game, mm -hmm. uh, maybe getting some youth and athleticism around some of those vets. Uh, what I saw with Steph tonight, he's 5 for 13 from the three-point line. So the three's not falling like he normally does, but still, he hits five threes. That's big. Steph still goes into the, into the paint, 6 for 12. You have the smallest guy on the court, but finding ways to get in the paint, Staying on his feet, jump stopping, finishing around the rim just speaks a lot to really the greatness of Stephen Curry right now as we're watching him evolve even in the game. Like there's no threes going in the paint. I think for the Golden State Warriors right now, finding ways to get those easy buckets, get into the block and, and go, go back to the post splits. I, I didn't see a lot of those tonight. You know, that's, that is something that the Warriors usually use to generate points when they're struggling from the three point line. I think this is just all part of the Warriors evolving. It's still 10 games into the season, so the season's still just starting. But for the Warriors, I think this is, this is a time to regroup. You're seeing the same team in two days. And so for the Warriors, you can watch film and you have a chance to come back and do this again on Tuesday. Yeah, and on the other end of the spectrum, the Timberwolves have a bright young star in Anthony Edwards. I love this young man. I love his game. I love the way he comes at everybody he plays against. He had, we, since he came into the NBA, he has no fear. And I'm talking about Anthony Edwards. He's coming to this league saying, I want to be on the first team all defense. Even with the guy, even with him being the guy who scores 20 points a game for his team, that's not enough. He's coming wanting to help his team win. And one of the reasons why his team is the number one defensive rated team in the NBA right now. Of all those great qualities that he has, he seems to be very coachable. And, he, and he's a sponge. He listens to advice from his teammates and his coaches, and he just keeps getting better and better. Uh, as for the Warriors, right now they're in the midst of a three-game losing streak. Meanwhile, the Minnesota Timberwolves have won six straight. Yeah, I think he, Cole Anthony Towns is the most skilled, talented big man in the league. He can shoot it from three, and you have to respect that. And when they, they come out and, and guard him, he can put it on the floor. We saw a beautiful alley-oop, big to big, from Towns to Rudy yep. Gobert. And then they come off with Nas Reed. So this, this uh, three, three headed uh, tandem of, of bigs with Minnesota, not only can they play together, uh, I think defensively they've really got to figure it out. Uh, and I think it really works because Colin T. Towns and Nas Reed.
can play out to the three-point line, which opens up space for Gobert on the inside offensively. Defensively, I think they do a really good job playing uh, the bigs in and the smalls out, communicate, communicate well. So, again, that's a huge reason why this Minnesota team has shown so much improvement early in the season. The length and athleticism has been the big knock for the Warriors when they're mm -hmm. facing teams like the Nuggets, like the Timberwolves. And these are the teams, that the Cavaliers, like we saw last night. What lessons are they learning early in the season, Festus, that they can apply throughout the rest of the season when they are facing teams that are bigger, faster, stronger? I think what I said before the game, that the points in the paint, for the Warriors, those are really important, right? The Warriors shoot threes, yes. But the ability to get to, to the three-point shot actually is determined by the ability to get to the paint. When the guards can get by their men and then create, that, that creates shots for people on the weak side. Right now, they're not able to beat their men off the dribble. For whatever reason, we have the, the coaches have to figure this out. But there's ways over the course of the offense where you create offense where you can beat a guy off the dribble. Maybe it's an athleticism issue. Some of these guys, Jaden McDaniels is, is a star athlete. K Kentavious Caldwell Pope for the Denver Nuggets was, was hard to go by. And you have a guy, Darius Garland, last night. So Warriors have to find ways to beat guys off the dribble, get into the paint so they can create shots for others, but also so they can create shots for themselves. Jonathan Kaminga is getting to the paint right now. He's a star athlete that's really showing himself. Tonight he had, what, 11 free throws? Was it 8 or 11 free throws? Uh, well, regardless, six. Next, to, next to Steph Curry's uh, 13 free throws, he's the next one that got to the line. So these are little points, little ways that the Warriors can involve. But like Steve Kerr keeps saying, with the lineup shift, he keeps trying different things. He has a lot of tools on his belt, keeps trying different things to see which ones work together, work well together. Yeah, uh, uh, um, athleticism and length and size has always been a major factor in the NBA game. Uh, defensively, it shows itself when you can take away the three-point shot and recover at the two. Uh, and you talk, we talked about Colin T. Towns, Nas Reed, and Rudy Gobert. J Jade McDaniel is 6'11", yeah. and he plays on the perimeter. Anthony Edwards is one of the best athletes in the league, and he really works hard on defensive end. Mike Conley is a big-time defender. So, you know, the Warriors, to me, offensively, it's about ball movement. Festus talks about breaking the paint. You break the paint a lot of different ways. But for the Warriors, I think the best way to do is drop the ball in the post, collapse the defense that way, and then run some, some handoffs where you're running down. You get a running start, not off the dribble. Pass ahead like a pistol action, things like that where you're, you, have, you have a running start and you're catching the ball where you can put that defense on their heels. If you don't do that, you're consistently shooting contested shots. Steph Curry, it really doesn't matter. The rest of the players, the, the, the normal players in the NBA, they need uncontested shots to shoot a decent percentage. Uh, and they have not been able to create high quality shots. Therefore, the percentages across the board are down. Yeah, Jonathan Kaminga, by the way, six of seven from the line. And that effortless ball movement that we typically see from the Warriors, that's been stifled against these big and fast and strong teams. We're getting a look right now at the team stack comparison for tonight's game. The Warriors fall to the Timberwolves. 116-110 the final. We get you out to Steve Kerr's post-game presser. This brought to you by BMW. much of your offensive struggles is just like you know what they ha the size they kind of have on you know in the interior and on the perimeter how much is just kind of your own internal struggles oh i thought uh, minnesota was great defensively um all night you know they they're number one defense in the league for a reason um they've got a lot of length and you know chris has them playing hard and together and um so they um it bothered us, but at the same time, we we did have open looks that we missed. I think 12 for 43 from from three. Uh, we can definitely shoot better. I think we will on Tuesday. Um, but um, they're they're playing well. They're playing probably better than anybody in the league. You know, having beaten Boston, Denver, uh, coming in here and beating us. So I give them credit. Steve, what there were a number of things obviously that you didn't like, but. What are the things that most concern you? I mean, I, I know fouling Piper was one of those things, but what are the things that most concerned you? I'm, I'm actually not overly concerned, to be honest with you. I think, um, you know, the season is filled with um, ups and downs, and, you know, we're, we're in a little bit of a, a spell right now. But, um, you know, it's not like we were the world's greatest team when we were 6-2 and two and we're not the world's worst team losing the last three. It's just uh, this is part of the season. And... Um, I think we we just played um, you know back to back uh, two great defensive teams that that you know throttled us and we need to um, 
figure out some things offensively, and I'm confident that we will. What on things on do you – go ahead. On the fouling, you, know, you guys had, I think, nine more than they did, and that's kind of been a theme off and on this yeah. season, even last season. What do you think that goes back to? Well, some of them are, are uh, just um, undisciplined reaches, and then some of them are, you know, we're just fighting and we're out of position or something. And um, so we, we, we know that we can cut back on, on some of the fouls. And then some, some nights there's going to be, you know, um, there's going to be some, some, some guys who get to the rim and we, we have no choice but to go up and challenge, and there's going to be fouls called. So um, I, I'm, like I said, it's early in the season, and um, I like this group a lot. Um, they're very well connected, and uh, we just have to keep keep going. I think we're going to win plenty of games, um, but right now we're just in a, in a little bit of a rut, um, and we'll we'll climb out of it. What things you say you need to figure out some things offensively? What do you think? Most a little better rhythm. Um, you know that we haven't had a, a ton of uh, last few games. We haven't had a ton of flow and rhythm. That they, some of the actions and plays that. Uh, you know, our fans are used to seeing us um, make, but a lot of that has to do with the defense. Again, um, you know, these last two teams um, that we played, playing two athletic bigs who, who can really patrol the paint and block shots, that makes it hard. So, um, you know, we had some, some games early where things were really flowing, and um, there's no reason why we can't, can't get that back. You guys still, like nobody besides Steph has scored over 20 in a game. How much... Do you guys just need somebody to, you know, have a game? I think Dario did, if I'm not mistaken. Or exactly yeah. 20 in open. Oh, okay, season. yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, we, no question. You know, we we need um, we need some scoring and some playmaking from elsewhere. So we got to keep keep plugging away, and um, you know, we'll uh, we'll we'll go go from there and see see where that takes us. There's, there's what happened at the end, which is your young guys really kind of for a second straight night coming in and making it interesting. Uh, does that make you reassess at all? Maybe like playing time a little bit moving forward, like maybe trying to in some of those guys. In? We've seen that Brandon and Trace are ready to contribute. We saw it in training camp. Like th these guys are, uh, they're they're ready, and so we have to make the decision. Um, you know, if we want to um, get them out there more, and um, I'd love to. It's um, it's tricky because we've got. Um, a lot of people were already playing 10, even without those guys. And, and I like everybody that, that I'm playing. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if we struggle, then we got to get guys out there who are going to give us a spark, and, and we know they're both capable. Thanks. Well, let's flip the script back to the Warriors and Andrew Wiggins, who showed out last night for Golden State. But tonight, just six points for Andrew Wiggins. He was 0 for 2 from three-point range, 3 of 7 from the field. Andrew Wiggins is a guy that has the ability to step up and help Steph Curry out. That's something that the Warriors need, Molly. No question. And, and we've seen Andrew Wiggins play at an all-star level. We've seen him dominate and be the second best player in the NBA Finals. And that's the player the Warriors need. And that's because Andrew's capable. Uh, as Steve Kerr said, early in the season, no time to panic. But if this team's going to go where they have plans on going, Andrew Wiggins is going to get back to that player he was uh, when they beat the Celtics in the finals. And, and you know what I remember about that period before he became the guy that, that had that streak in the playoffs was he had a, he was struggling that second half of that season and he was able to pull himself out for the situation for the moment. So I think it's possible for him to come out of this. I, this is not we all go through shooting slumps. What I still love is that he's still being aggressive. You saw some of those clips getting out in transition. All those things are important. But I think for the Warriors as a whole, moving the ball and really attacking the paint is going to be really important for this team. And we're going to step aside for a quick break here on Toyota Warriors Post Game Live. The Warriors fall to the Timberwolves, 116-110 the final. Coming up next, we are going to talk about Clay Thompson and what his future holds, as well as welcome in our NBC Sports Warriors correspondent, Mark Stein. That's just ahead along on this Sunday night as we get a look at the longest tenured coaches in the NBA. Steve Kerr coming in at number three with his 10 years with Golden State. Four He's chips also in 10 years. Come on now. It's pretty not too shabby. Okay. Not too shabby. He's also in the final year of his contract as many of you know. Earlier we caught up with NBC Sports Warriors contributor Mark Stein. Here he is on Kerr's future with the team.
Yeah, I, I have yet to encounter anyone who thinks that he would be leaving. Uh, you know, any time I check on his contract si situation, the sense I get from those conversations is that it oh. is going to happen. And when exactly, I can't tell you today, but is it something that could happen in season? I do think it is something that could happen in season. You know, I think maybe in San Antonio, there's there's maybe a, a, among Spurs fans kind of a hope that Steve Kerr would have interest in replacing Greg Popovich. But I really feel that's like more more of a wish than anything based in reality. For one reason, you know, Pop Pop just got Wemby. He's not going anywhere. He's, you know, I think, you know, Pop could coach into his 80s now. But it, it, look, in all seriousness, I think other coaches around the league were kind of looking to Steve previously that he would be a guy to really use his leverage to move up coaching salaries. But then it happened anyway this summer. Monty Williams got a massive deal in Detroit. Greg Popovich got an even larger contract to stay with the Spurs. And the expectation around the league definitely is that that Steve Kerr is ultimately going to resign with the Warriors and stay coaching this team. I mean, if you had Stephen Curry as your star player, I don't think you'd want to go anywhere. Yeah, I don't think there's uh, any wanting to leave when you've got Steph Curry on your squad. Uh, Steve Kerr, as Mark Stein said, has been he's been with his team for 10 years now. Four NBA championships, as you mentioned, Festus. It seems like he's pretty locked in here with Golden State. I mean, right from the, the first time he came in. He came into a culture that was already, that we had these young guys. We were, we had aspirations of winning a championship. And it's immediately he wanted to increase the camaraderie of the team. He talked about ball movement, all the things that years now uh, the Warriors have been known for. Initially, a, a, a dominance of Steph Curry was established under the, the coaching of Mark Jackson. And Steve Kerr came in and he really took this team to a whole nother level, won a championship his first year. He talked about that, how he thought maybe when he came in, this team had a chance to, to do something special and maybe we could win a championship down the line after a few years. But really coming in that year, uh, the guys not relenting. And this is why we believe in this team so much is because the guys are unrelenting. Steph Curry is a champion. Klay Thompson is a champion. Draymond Green, Kevon Looney. These guys are champions for a reason. They have proved it over and over and over. And they have a coach who also loves winning but he also finds ways to get his team together. Yeah, Steve Kerr is going to get paid, uh, and he deserves it. He's won four championships in 10 years. As Festus said, he's, he's developed a, a culture here. You looked at that list of the tenured coaches with Popovich, uh, Spolstra, Steve Kerr, Mike Malone. Uh, all those guys won championships. Uh, but Steve Kerr, he has an ability to not, not only uh, hang banners, but it's the way he does it, his connection with the players. Uh, his awareness of, of uh, issues outside of basketball, and, and all the while doing with humility. Uh, and he played for Coach Popovich, he played for Lenny Wilkins, and he's taken all those different coaches' styles and, and developed his own style, his own culture here with Golden State. It's been incredibly successful on the court, and it's been as successful off the court. And whatever he gets paid, he deserves. He, they probably can't pay him enough to stay here and coach. He's also very well respected around the NBA, not just by players, but amongst all other coaches yeah. in the NBA. Uh, opposing teams, players respect him. He sets the bar very high for his players. But the, the level that they rise to is all about pushing each other. And he's going to win an Olympic gold medal next summer. 2024. Let's go. Right the last go round. Steve, <laughs> Steve Kerr's last dance. For USA basketball. For USA, yeah, yeah, USA yeah, basketball. He says he will. <laughs> Much like the Cleveland game. The Warriors never really dictated tempo, pace of play to get that rhythm and flow they want. Uh, they committed 28 fouls tonight, which slows the game down, which is advantage to Minnesota. Uh, and when you think of Steph and Clay, and when they get on those rolls where they knock down, you know, several threes in a row, and the building gets rocking, and the opposing coach has to call a timeout. Not only is that offensive rhythm and flow, it's getting stops. So when Minnesota tonight shoots 52% from the field. That's slowing the game down. You're taking the ball out of basket. You're playing against set defense time and time again. And not just the normal defense, the number one defense in the league, yes. where they're running you off the three-point line, contesting twos. And if you take it all the way to the basket, you got to deal with Rudy Gobert, Carl Anthony Towns, and Nas Reed. Molly, just keep talking about defense. I, 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 I'm loving this. Whenever you start talking about defense, I, I get excited. It's, it's really cool because 
Um, I understand that this Golden State Warriors team, they, they really right now are struggling on the defensive end and showing on the offensive end. But Klay Thompson's one of those guys. We have high expectations because he set the bar that high. We know what he can do on the offensive end. It's not from a lack of trying. He's out there. And tonight was one of those nights where, you know, a few of those shots go, the house goes rocking, and I know that he's going to keep coming back, coming back. The next game, I think you're going to have him in better spots on the court. They're going to look at this game. It's actually a, this. I actually am looking at this series, this two-game series, as like a preview to the playoffs. You have a chance to see the same defense twice, and so you can make adjustments based on that. I can't wait to see what Steve Kerr draws up for Clay. Yeah, I'm sure adjustments will be made before Tuesday night's matchup. Again, the Timberwolves will be back here at Chase Center on Tuesday night. Let's move on to Draymond Green. Nine points, seven rebounds. Uh, I mean, seven assists and nine rebounds, nine points. That's a good effort. Uh, but again. To me, the Warriors, they're getting somewhat good individual efforts. It's, it's not coming together mm -hmm. uh, to impact winning, and they're not doing it as a unit. You know, you can go up and down a lap, and this guy played a good game, that guy played a good game, put up good stats. But till they really figure out uh, and generate on the offensive end high-quality shots where they can get their percentages up consistently, it's going to be tough sledding. Especially because he is the heart and soul. He's the guy who generates that defensive pressure. And so for Draymond, you know, those numbers are, are great. That's what you expect from Draymond in a win or in a loss. Those, those numbers are amazing. I think that energy now for this team is much needed, especially in a time like this when the team has gone through three, three losses in a row. It's so easy for you to get in this slump. I think it's a, guy's who's, a guy whose voice is very needed in the locker room at this time so they can bounce back next game. And it's not just getting shots. The Warriors got 96 field goal attempts to the Minnesota's 82. Uh, it's generating quality shots. If you look at the, the three-point shots, Steph and Clay combined to take 23 threes. If you're a defense, that drives you that would, that would drive you crazy, but they were not high-quality shots, so they wound up shooting, was it, 8 for 23 from the three-point line? So, you know, again, you have to give the Minnesota defense credit, but also the Warriors have to figure out how to generate higher-quality shots uh, consistently. Yeah, Draymond Green is at the podium right now. We get you live inside to Chase Center to hear from Draymond Green. Draymond, how much of the last couple of nights were just tough matchups, and how much of it were you guys trying to find yourselves, just struggling to get what you guys need for yourselves? Uh, we got to be better. Um, NBA is a tough league, so it's a tough matchup every night to play against NBA players. Um, but I like the matchup, so I don't necessarily view it as a tough matchup. We got to play better, but that didn't start tonight. Steph obviously has been carrying the offense for the most part. Um, what do you think has to happen to get everybody else kind of unlocked? I mean, Clay and Wiggs are the guys you tend to look for for, for production there. Uh, we just got to get more organized. We're not doing a great job of getting organized. I got to do a better job there, making sure we're getting into some things. Um, Chris got to do a better job there, making sure we think we both need to do a better job of getting us into things. Um, you know, when Steph's got it going, he's got it going, and he's just moving and going. You know, and it's on us to realize that and – um, learn how to also use him, you know, when he's got it going to get other guys looks as well. And so I think that fall on me and Chris and we'll be better with it. Steve, I mean, I guess it's along the same lines, but Steve was just saying like the flow isn't there right now. Is that organization or is that just at times just, you know, I don't know, early in the season, new pieces. I mean, does it still feel like you guys are trying to figure it out? No, I think it's organization for sure. Um, we've had moments where, you know, it looks great, you know, so I don't look at it as like, oh, we're still trying to figure it out. We all know, you know, the guys that we're next, playing next to and um, figuring out, you know, the rotations and all of that. We make a bunch of excuses. They don't fucking matter. So we as players have to be better. Um, and that's just what it boils down to. I mean, you guys still don't have a guy that scored more than 20 besides Steph. I mean, is it some of that you just needed a guy or two to, to get going? Yeah, we got to step up. Um, you know, when, when you're playing well, players get the credit and you get paid, right? It's the lead we're in. You play well, you get credit, you get paid, you get all-star appearances, you get all defensive teams, all NBA teams, this thing, that thing. When you're playing bad, players got to fucking take – the blame as well. You know, we can come up here and point a bunch of fingers. We can say, oh, man, coach could have did this better. Or 
you know, um, the referees could have been better. You can go up and point a lot of fingers. At the end of the day, you play basketball, you're, it's your job to figure it out and be better. And so that falls on all of us. And you got to take on that challenge um, of being better and giving to the team what you need to give to the team. One through 20 or however many players we got these days. Kaminga on the night off the bench. He played 23 minutes and 35 seconds. He had 10 points off the Warriors bench. We're following up on the edge right now. This brought to you by Great Resort uh -oh. and Casino. How are we feeling, guys? Man, it's been a rough uh, week. A little light. We'll <laughs> <slow up. laughs> okay. We'll uh, breeze right past this then, shall we? Yeah. Let's go to break, fellas. Dario Saric came off the bench tonight for the Warriors. 27 minutes. He scored 11 points, which is the most off the bench tonight. He's sitting at the podium inside Chase Center right now. We get you inside, Chase, for some reaction right now from Saric. Dario, playing these guys again on Tuesday night, what do you think is the biggest adjustment that needs, that needs to be made? Um... <laughs> I think we need to play better offensively. It's hard to say right now, you know, what was the real issue and real problem, you know. Last couple of games, we kind of struggled with the offense a little bit, but, you know, I think we're going to figure out and bounce back off that. And, uh, you know, I think we probably pretty solid in the defensively. I think we were, like, solid there. I think they didn't have, like, so much offensive rebounds, nine, which is kind of okay. You know, just offense. We need to try to figure it out, you know, get some easy buckets. You know, seems like we really struggle to get the, some easy ones. So, you know, it's hard to say right now what was the exactly uh, adjustments going to be. Dario, what are the keys to getting those easy buckets? You know, what are some of the major things that need to happen in order to turn things around offensively, as, as collectively? I mean, like they always say, you know, defensively, you know, we need a. If you are good in defense, you know, you can run fast breaks and that kind of stuff. But I think we were kind of solid defensively, you know, just some major things. Um, how many turnovers we had? Fourteen. Uh, no, fourteen. You know, if you get put on twelve, you know, that would be nice. I mean, a lot of easy shots, you know, sometimes like miss the layups, you know, try to, you know, get a better open shots. It's it's hard to say. It's hard to say right now, but obviously, you know, offensively we struggle a little bit, you know. I think we need to maybe share the ball more or something like that, but I don't think anybody plays selfish, you know. It's just like maybe these couple of games, you know, seems like that, so we need to figure out of course we will, but you know, sometimes it takes time. Welcome to Dubs Talk Live. I am Zena Kata, joined by Warriors reporter Monty Poole. We are here live at Chase Center where the Warriors just lost their third straight game and two at home mm -hmm. against the Minnesota Timberwolves going down 116 to 110. Monty, Steve Kerr just said that he is, quote, not overly concerned yeah, he did. about the way that the Warriors are playing. What do you think after tonight's game? Um, overly concerned. It's maybe too early in the season to be overly concerned. Sure, sure. But there's reason to be worried, I think. You know, you're seeing enough. When you, in the NBA, I'm going to start here. In the NBA, a team can get old before you know it. Mm. It can happen quickly. And I'm not saying the Warriors are there, but I'm saying that going into this season, they know they were a veteran team. And in the NBA, young teams can make you look bad if they are long and athletic. And the Cavaliers are long and athletic. Yep. The Timberwolves are long and athletic. So they're bad matchups for the Warriors. And the Warriors have to figure out a way to make their intellect and their shooting ability, which really hasn't really been there besides Steph, mm. uh, to get them some, some wins. Sure. And I think they will. But right now, the offense gets clogged by teams that are just bigger than they are and quicker than they are. And it's just going to be tough. And Steph right now is having a great start, but he's kind of riding alone. Mm -hmm. You know, it's Steph and who else? Right. And right. Uh, Sarge is the only person on the, other, on, on the rest of the team that's had a 20-point game.
And you can't succeed with that recipe. That is a crazy stat to think that no one else has had an over 20 point game at this point in the season. Again, it is still early. It is a small sample size, but that sort of impact is necessary in order to be a dominant team within the NBA. Steve Kerr said something else on that same point mm -hmm. of he understands that he's got to be able to find more offensive production than just Steph Curry. Steph, uh, offense has been really tough to come by at home. Is it the opponent or just the uh, out of rhythm at, at Chase Center? Um, I don't know what the numbers look like on the road and how much of a discrepancy there is there, but we've played you know, two good defenses these last two games. Haven't been able to uh, – Cleveland was more our defense affecting our offense, but obviously you still got to put points on the board. Tonight was uh, just a little disjointed rhythm early. And, you know, you can't ever really build up a, a presence here. We can get our crowd into it and really feel good about what we're doing. It seems like we're chasing the whole game. so. I think the outcome has been because of a lot of different reasons, and we got to figure it out. It's, uh, I think, nine out of 10 games or 10 out of 11. No one else has scored 20. Can you feel the the, the extra focus or whatever, or the defense saying we're going to let the other guy shoot and just take away you? I mean, there's always been an approach of guarding us. Uh, for years, like you know who you, where attention is going to be, and you're just trying to blitz me in a pick and roll or stay body tight on Clay when he doesn't have it coming off pin downs or, you know, whatever the case is. So we have to make adjustments. We can't just keep doing the same thing and expecting different results. But it's not a panic or anything. It's just a matter of getting a little smarter and a little bit more organized on how we're creating good shots. And trusting that you know we have the ability to do that with our with our rotations and the, the combinations that we put out there, so um, it does feel like everything's kind of tough to come by in terms of creating good looks. But that's not something that we feel like is unfixable. Step is that a double negative. I'll get my grammar police. Okay, thank you. Uh, Steph, some of these issues you, issues you guys have had in the paint over the last two games, how do you go about correcting them? I mean, it's tough. Just We're not like a uh, paint-dominant team where you know, we, we get that with wig slashing. Uh, when you have breakdowns because of the threat of shooting, you can get slips and all that type of stuff. We're not a team that's just going to throw it in the post and get – you know, looks like that never really have been, but it's about understanding, like, the last two t defenses we played, they've have you know, have had two big presence in, in, in the paint, you know, Mobley and, and uh, Jared Allen and then, you know, Rudy and, and, and Kat tonight. So you're not just going to – we get we get stuck a little bit, and I had two turnovers tonight where you don't have a plan when you get in there, and you know those those big guys are you know long and lengthy at the rim, and you don't have options, so you have to play under control in those type of situations. But honestly, if our defense, you know, with the fouling and getting stops, that fuels our offense. That's always been our strength. If you don't, they have to be connected. So that's a big part of loosening up defenses that are. You know, trying to make us take the tough jumpers and keeping everybody out in the perimeter. Uh, Steph, um, some of the young guys came in at the end and they made a little run. Um, do you think they could have been u utilized earlier in the game? And are you expecting them to be a part of the next game? In terms of, I'm minutes? just super proud of the way that they've approached. It's like two games in a row now where they've come with a big burst of energy when the game felt like it was out of touch. And that's just showing that they stay ready and they have a sense of pride of taking advantage of whatever minutes and whatever they're asked to do. Everything is on the table for us for adjustments when you, you know, we've lost three straight and you have to make adjustments. I don't know if that's a rotation thing or 
uh, you know, whatever the case is, but everything is on the table and everybody has to be ready to to step in and do what they're asked to do based on what coach kind of sees and what we talk about before Tuesday. So they're obviously capable. They've played minutes for us on the road. And I think it was in Cleveland and Denver. They played pretty well. So just stay ready. I told BP that after the game, things change really quickly. Steph, um, on a little on a little different note, ni nice to see you. Uh, Kelly Oubre meant a lot to you guys um, in his in his time here, I know. And um, have you um, maybe reached out to him? That's a little little bit scary and shocking, I'm sure, when you see anyone <laughs> go through through an accident like that. Um, any any thoughts? No, I mean, our thoughts are uh, with him. That's such a scary, you know. Uh, or scary news to get, and you know, thankfully he's. If I think from all accounts he's going to be okay. You know, basketball aside, it's that's a blessing. Uh, we said a prayer for him before the game, before we took the court. Just we've loved this time here. No, you know, it was only that one year, but just pray that he has a quick recovery and. Um, and him and his family find peace to it. He's got a beautiful family, and you know it's obviously bigger than basketball in the sense of him being okay and taking care of his himself for for life. So uh, I hope he has a full recovery. Hey, Steph, uh, Matt Lively, CBS Bay Area News. So nice to nice to meet you. Uh, with Tuesday coming up, does the in season tournament game have a different feel to it? Is it more of a playoff atmosphere for you guys? Oh, absolutely. It felt like that in OKC. It's, OKC is going to feel like that Tuesday. And there's even bigger stakes for us to respond to, you know, getting beat by the same team we're playing on Tuesday. So got to come with it. And we have to understand that there are uh, consequences uh, associated with those four games that you play in your pool and trying to get to Vegas. So, uh I love it because it gives you an extra sense of urgency um, early in the year. Have the guys figured out the format, or is there still a little bit of confusion about how to advance? If you just take the time to read the situation, it's pretty straightforward. Um, I love the commentary around nobody knows what's going on, but if you actually just take a second, take a deep breath, and understand there are six groups and whoever has the best record out of the six groups and two wild cards go and then you play a bracket from there and try to get to Vegas the final four play two games championship is an extra game but there's monetary stakes on the line and then everybody else who doesn't make the the, uh, the bracket gets regular season games made up pretty simple Pretty simple. What's the chance of having a 40-second home game? If you're the. could have a 40-second home game if you. I'm not at all the ticket. We were going through it today on ticket sales. So what you do, you wouldn't know until like two days ahead of time. It's a, it's a great thing. Steph, just one more question. I'm sorry. I know you said um, there's. Um, I mean, yeah, that, that definitely qualifies as an adjustment, just trying to keep our offense maybe a little bit more simple through the meat of the game. Uh, I know our offense is definitely predicated on ball movement and player movement, but when you have teams that try to force you into situations and, you know, uh, send a crowd to certain guys, you have to have counters and and if uh, if things aren't kind of materializing the way you want to in the media game, that is a way to kind of slow it down and, and try to orchestrate, you know, good sh good shot creation, um, take advantage of matchups and all that type of stuff. Uh, we've done it before, not to the level that probably other teams do, but we've had success kind of trying to find a nice balance and. It's that and our defense and everything else combined that'll help us get over the hump.
tonight the Warriors struggled to find a shot. They ended up 12 of 43 from the three-point line, and that meant they had to change their offensive identity a little bit mm -hmm. and go do what the thing that they don't do much of, mm -hmm. and that is put the ball on the floor, attacking the basket. Yeah. As I watched the game, I was kind of curious, how often does the war do the Warriors actually put the ball on the floor, attack the basket, and it was easy to find this statistic. They are last in the league in drives per game at about 33 per game. They're also last in the league at points off of those drives, about 17. And they've been in the bottom five for the last five years. Now, when you think about who you've had around your roster, that makes sense. You yeah. got Stephen Curry, you got Klay Thompson. It's raining. <laughs> Whether it's at Oracle Arena or now Chase right. Center, you haven't had to put the ball on the floor. But when you're having nights like this, shooting 20, about 28% from three, putting the ball on the floor and attacking the baskets, the only way you really can go. Yeah, I mean, this team is built on largely on three-point shooting on this offense. I mean, they, they spread the floor and they find a way to get Steph and Clay involved. And in the past, you've had other guys there. You know, mm -hmm. you've always had three or four three-point shooters on this team. And right now, the only one that's making them is Steph and, and, and Draymond, who wasn't part of that group. Right. <laughs> you know? No. He's not part of he that group. He wasn't the one building no. up the Splash Brothers right. and all no, that. No, he guys. wasn't part of that group. So, <laughs> so um, but the, the problem with the Warriors that the Warriors have against a team like the, the Cavaliers or against a team like the Timberwolves is that when you drive into the paint, you're going into the land of Giants. Mm -hmm. I mean, those guys, whether it's the Cavaliers with Jared Allen and Evan Mobley, yep. or whether it's the Timberwolves with Nas Reed, with Rudy Gobert, with Carl Anthony Towns, with, they've That's got a long, yeah, they got a long yeah. list of guys who can come out there and, and throw seven foot wingspans at you. And so you're kind of darned if you do, darned if you don't, mm -hmm. you know? And if your three's not falling against this team, you're probably going to be in trouble yeah. just because of the way they're built. And, you know, Draymond said after the game, he said, you know, we, we had too many instances tonight. And he said, I did it, S Chris did it, Steph did it, Clay did it, where we're driving into the paint without a plan. Ooh. And, and you go up in the air and it's yes. like, oh, what am I going to do? And next thing you know, it's a turnover. Yep. You know. Yep. And yep. so that happened again tonight. It happened last night against the Cavaliers. Yeah. So they're not used to it. Mm -hmm. They're not used to attacking like that. To me, the one guy who is built for attacking like that in the starting lineup is Wiggs. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and he doesn't do it enough. He doesn't do it enough. And I think that's one thing he needs to do to get himself going. Yeah. You know, when he gets to the rim, it kind of can get him going. He has, that doesn't do it enough. And I thought tonight, for sure, he would come out with some fire. It's his old team. Yeah. You know, right. he loves yeah. to play against those guys. I mean, you know, he dunked on Carl Anthony Towns a couple of years ago, and Steph said, you know what, from now on, I just, I just show it to Wiggs every game. I'm yes, going to show, exactly. show him that video every game, get him fired up. <laughs> get you know? him ready, yeah, exactly. But, but obviously tonight it just wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And so um, the driving to the hoop against this team is risky because of their size. Well, not only, you know, I thought that Jonathan Kaminga and Dario Sarge actually really did mm -hmm. show a little bit of there's, there's, it's possible to drive into the trees yes. and find success, right? Yes. They were able to do that, especially at the start of the game, but then it just kind of died it, yeah. it, where they weren't maybe getting the calls that they were looking for, et cetera. I am particularly remembering that drive, though, that Jonathan Kaminga had in the very beginning of the game. Early, first Early, yeah. Nas yeah. Reed trying to pull him down. Yeah, literally. As he's still going up. I yeah. mean, I thought his shorts might come down. Yeah. It was kind of crazy. Teams in the NBA, young guys in the NBA, look at the OGs of the NBA and go, you know what, I can take you now. Mm. I can take you now. And you look at Warrior, the Warriors, their core, Steph, Clay, Draymond, and young guys are gonna try them because they're like, you guys are probably done now. You know, your time has passed. And meanwhile, Steph, Clay, and Draymond are trying to prove that their time has not passed. Yeah, So right. that's the deal. And so I think they're going to see a lot of teams come after them. It's what you normally would do. When you look at the, the games that they've lost, it's because teams were, you know, did come after them, whether it was Cleveland or Minnesota tonight I mean, with some good young talent out there. I mean, Anthony Edwards took 27 shots. He was coming after the Warriors, mm -hmm. you know. So this is going to be, I think, a theme. Yeah. When you get to it, when a team gets to a certain age, other teams feel like, okay, I don't care how good you were last year or five years ago or ten years ago. This is about now. Yeah. Do what you try and stop me now, mm -hmm. and, and they'll come after you like that. So, I think in some cases the Warriors will be fine. I think in other cases they could be in a little bit of trouble. Again, the teams that they've seen the last two nights, tough matchups. Well, what's interesting is that I think when your team that's preparing, and you know, even when I played, I remember. 
you hate the storylines. Mm -hmm. If you're the team that's not expected to win, mm -hmm. you hate the storylines going into the game, right? You think about the Cleveland Cavaliers and how much that concept of how many times has it been since, or how much time has passed mm -hmm. since they last beat the Warriors in the regular season, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You hate those type of storylines that make you feel like the underdog. So you come up amped, right? You come into yep. that arena like, I'm not only going to make this story go away, yep. but I'm about to change the narrative yep. as well. So I definitely anticipate a lot of teams wanting to do that against the storied Warriors. Yeah, I mean, young guys come into the league with an edge. A lot of them do, you yeah. know? And so it, I, I can just hear some of the young guys looking at the Warriors, you know, over the summer and going, man, they think Chris Paul is the answer? Mm. He's 38, and he's almost 40, you know? Ooh. Just talking like that, you know? Right. I'm like, come yeah. on, man. <laughs> They're the Warriors? Yeah, but when they were back with Steph and, and, and KD and Clay and Andre, okay, but now? Come on, Warriors. Right, right. And so I think they're going to see guys challenge them in ways that maybe they wouldn't have before. The fear factor is gone. Mm -hmm. The intimidation factor is gone. The mystique of who the Warriors have been is not what it once was. And so if you're a young team and you're full of yourself, you're going to come in here looking and make a statement. And the last two nights, statements were made. Oh, yeah. They came with the smoke, as I said. Now, thinking about the mystique and, and kind of looking at the Warriors past and Warriors now, there's one player that comes to mind, and that is Kevon Looney, <laughs> right? When you think about Kevon Looney, you think about that nickname Iron Man Loon, mm -hmm. the person that's been able to do the dirty work, the person that's gonna been able to so, uh, succumb to everything that's going on with his body and still play hard yes. and still show up. Yep. And yet, there's been a little bit of inconsistency in terms of his production. Yeah. Um, not only from an offense perspective, of course, yeah, he's not know. supposed to be that score, right. but cleaning up the boards yeah. and things of that sort. What do you make of Kevon Looney's performance so far? Uh, I think um, he's kind of carrying it. He's carrying the kind of weight on the one end that Steph is carrying on the other end. It's a lot to ask. I mean, Draymond was not there at the beginning of the season. Sure. So Loon is like, okay, I got to do my job and Draymond's job too. No matter yeah. who else they put out there, I got to do my job and Draymond's job too. I mean, Clay was kind of moved into the front court when Draymond was out. But that's a new uh, role for Clay. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you got guys trying to get used to things. Draymond comes back, and now Looney is still. I think with Loon, I, I think he's so proud of playing every game. Yep. I don't think it would hurt this season if the Warriors have a couple of games when they say, okay, Loon, just rest. Just take the night off. I know he doesn't want that, but I think it might be good for this team in the long run. And, and that, that could apply to all the vets. And Loon is a vet now. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I, I just think that he needs to take care of himself and he's carrying a heavy load. It's a really heavy load. And just imagine, though, what would happen to this team if they didn't have Loon.